looked at some twin concordant and discordant studies, identical twin. And I was surprised to see, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, but I was surprised at how heritable obesity was. It was about 0.7. Um, and that's, I mean, when you see heritability of 0.7, that tells you something is very, very genetically predetermined. So even though a hundred years ago, virtually none of us were obese and today, let's just call it your lifetime incidence of obesity is 50% tells you, and our genes haven't changed in a hundred years. So clearly our susceptibility for obesity has been with us for a great period of time. And it is highly, highly preserved. It's just that in the last, whatever, 40, 50 years, we now have matched or mirrored our genes to an environment that is allowing that trait to flourish. What do we know about the genes that, that regulate obesity or fatness? Let's just talk about it through that lens, I suppose. Yeah, the meta-analysis of twin studies that I like to um, cite these days suggests an average heritability of 75 percent wow that's so even stronger yeah it's it's massive and and there's some debate about that yeah. you know i think but but directionally this is this is a really big deal it's very heritable yeah. yeah and a lot of things are very heritable i think that's one thing we're learning um but yeah so you have this this very high heritability of body mass index so um variation between individuals in body mass index about 75 percent of those differences between people is explained by their genetics that's what that implies and um if we look at other methods that have tried to figure out what are the genes that underlie this what are the genetic differences these are the genome-wide association studies that i think are particularly informative in this regard they simply ask the question, if we look at the entire genome and we look at these representative genetic markers where different people have different uh, genetic code called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where in the genome, what markers correlate with differences in body mass index? Fortunately, body mass index is really easy to measure, so you can get really big sample sizes in these studies, which you need to get statistically significant results because you're looking at, I think like millions, I don't remember exactly how many, but you're looking at a lot of genomic markers. So you need tremendous statistical power to detect anything with, with a high level of confidence. So you have these studies, I think the latest is like 800,000 people. Hmm. Um, the leader of the pack is, is the height genome wide association study. I think they have like 3 million. And now they've saturated the heritability. They've gotten all the information they can with that sample size out of what the common gene genetic variants are that correlate with differences in height. So I think with body mass index, we may, in the near future, we may saturate it as well. We may know what are all the common genetic differences that correlate with differences in, in body mass index. So um, essentially, so far, these studies have identified, I think, like 900 variants that differ. So what this suggests is that differences in body mass index between individuals are very complex, that genetically very complex. They're determined by a lot of different genes with very small effect sizes. So you get this sorting of all these different genes and whatever combination you get, lucky or unlucky, determines whether you're, to a large degree, determines whether you are susceptible or not susceptible to obesity in a, in a fattening environment, is, is the way I would put it. And um, so they have various ways of looking at what these genes are doing, because, you know, that's one way you can use these genome-wide association studies that's particularly informative is you could say what's the underlying biology that makes some people fatter and some people slimmer. And I wanna talk a little bit about why this is such an important approach. One is that you're looking, people, you're looking at people in their regular everyday context. This is not an artificial lab scenario. You're just looking at people living their lives and experiencing higher or lower weight. And you're saying what genes correlate with that. So it's very naturalistic. 
Second, it's very replicable. These studies are highly replicable. In other words, if you do three studies of this nature, you're going to tend to get similar results. So the methodology, it's one of the most rigorous, I would say, in the biological sciences that we have. And the third- And I think that, um, sorry, I'll let you finish because I was going to add something to that, but go ahead. Um, and the third one is that it's unusually objective as well. It has a higher level of built-in objectivity, resistance to bias compared to other types of investigation because it's not hypothesis driven. You're just looking across the whole genome and seeing what pops up. You're not saying, I'm gonna focus on the connection between X biological process and Y outcome. You're just saying, I'm interested in Y outcome, what correlates with it, and let's see what biology pops up. Could be anything, we're just gonna see. And so that really gives you a chance to, I think, check your thinking on what the underlying biology is in various traits and, and diseases. Yeah, and I think, I think part of that comes from the strength of what ultimately makes genetic analyses like Mendelian randomization so powerful is the genes are randomly distributed. So that's what cleans out some of those biases is when you are looking at a million people for, for whom the genes are randomly spread across them and you take an unbiased view of the sample and then you get those results over and over and over again, I think it becomes very powerful. And, and look, you know, if people are listening to us saying, God, what are these guys talking about? I mean, I think it's just important <laughs> to understand the big picture here. The big picture here is a thousand years ago, a thousand years ago, to all intents and purposes, none of us were obese, but that still means directionally 50% of us at least had the genes that would allow us to become obese in an obesogenic environment. That's really all the, that's, that's really what we're explaining here is that there are a highly, highly heritable set of genes that will allow a subset of the population. And actually one of the things I'm just curious about your thoughts are teleologically, why is it 50%? Why isn't it a hundred percent, right? Like why is it that more people don't have that? W was this just a fluke of evolution? Was this, you know, you would, you would almost think that evolution would have wanted everybody to have those genes. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish up the, the thought we were on previously just to wrap that up, but I, I would like to get back to that. Um, so we have this incredible methodology for um, looking at, you know, and, and just to step, since, since you want to step back a little bit, I just want to also add, like, what we're talking about is why, you know, some people can effortlessly stay thin and other people have to really struggle to maintain their weight and maybe are not able to. So that's kind of like the, the everyday yep. thing that we're trying to explain here that I think many people recognize intuitively that that is you know, a thing, that different people have different uh, propensities for becoming obese um, or developing obesity or not. And um, yeah, so we can look at the underlying biology and that's been done. And there are a couple of different ways you can do it. One is you can say, what are the genes that, are, that seem to be associated with these genomic differences and where are those expressed? What tissues are those expressed in? And there was a paper where they looked at, I think, 43 different traits of all kinds, diseases, personality traits, other stuff. And, uh, and, they, and they asked, what, what does the tissue enrichment look like? And if you look at body mass index, it looks like psychiatric diseases and educational attainment. So all, all of those are heavily enriched for brain-related genes to a similar degree. So conditions that we know are related to the brain, like educational attainment, how, you know, how, how many years of education you've attained, whether you are susceptible to schizophrenia, depression, Tourette's, like all these brain related conditions, obviously the brain shows up in genome wide association studies for those conditions. And you put those next to body mass index and you couldn't tell them apart. Like that's how heavily enriched for brain related biology body mass index is. And those diseases, by the way, that you just mentioned are some of the most heritable diseases 
we see in medicine. I mean, when you look at autism, when you look at schizophrenia, these have heritability indexes of 0.6 to 0.7. They're, they're, they're highly genetic conditions. So there's two things going on, right? Which is you have these parallel things that are highly, highly genetic, and then they're disproportionately concentrated in the brain. That's right. And um, so we know it's, you know, and I don't want to say that it's literally 100% about the brain. I think that's unlikely to be true, but it's certainly the primary signal that emerges across the literature. And, um, and so I think that really validates this idea of the brain being important for body fatness. And if we look, at, you know, a little bit deeper at what is going on, for a lot of it, we don't really know. We don't really know exactly how the brain is doing this what it is about these genes, but we can see that it correlates with certain types of ways of interacting with food. So people that have obesity promoting genes tend to uh, have greater eating drive, they tend to have lower satiety, um, and but this is an area that hasn't really been very well explored yet. So there's a lot we don't know. Um, however, if you look at the monogenic obesity syndromes, so where there's one mutation that causes severe obesity, those really revolve around the leptin brain signaling axis. So those mutations tend to be in leptin, the leptin receptor, melanocortins, melanocortin receptor that are downstream of leptin in the brain. Um, and those types of signals also show up in the genome-wide association studies, but they're not dominant. A lot of this stuff is really general. It's like yeah. stuff that affects general neuronal development and you know neurotransmitters that are involved in a lot of stuff. So I think there's a long way to go before we really understand exactly how those genes are affecting the brain in a way that in, in, uh, impacts body fatness. But I do think we can say that differences in body fatness between individuals are primarily determined by differences in how the brain is constructed and how it operates.